to Spiritual Calisthenics. Christ is in our midst. Today on Sunday, March 3rd, we commemorate the Sunday of the Prodigal Son, the Holy Martyrs Ephtropios, Cleonikos, and Vasilikos, Saint Theodoretos, the Holy Martyr of Antioch, Saint Nonita, the mother of Saint David. The martyrs who were from Amasia were fellow soldiers and kinsmen of Saint Theodor the Tiro, the recruit, who we commemorate on February 17th. They were portrayed to the governor Asclepidiotas as Christians during the reign of Diocletian, about the years 284 to 305. After many torments, Ephtropius and Glonikos were crucified. Vasilikos was not slain together with them, but was shut up in prison in the hope that with time he might change his mind and sacrifice to the idols. He was beheaded on May 22nd. And so we will see his account on that day. Your martyrs, O Lord, in their courageous contest for you received as the prize the crowns of incorruption and life from you, our immortal God. For since they possessed your strength, they cast down the tyrants and wholly destroyed the demon's strengthless presumption. O Christ, by their prayer, save our souls, since you alone are merciful. From St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Brethren, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Meaning that we are able to do anything. There is no absolute restrictions on us anymore as Christians, because the idea is that we have encountered freedom, real free will, which is exhibited in Jesus Christ. In the story of the prodigal son, which we'll get into more depth in the gospel, the son thinks he has freedom, and so he's able to do whatever he wants, but not all things are helpful. They're not necessarily beneficial, and so he makes himself a slave to other passions. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. And this is the problem, is that we think we have freedom, but we make ourselves a slave. This is something we see a lot of times with addictions. Well, they say, well, I'm not addicted. I'm in control of the situation, which is a lie that we tell ourselves. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Meaning that we can take uh, the human condition and say, well, we're animals, and we are supposed to act like animals, and so therefore men should have many partners because that's what animals do. And no, we are not like animals. Our body was made for the Lord. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power, meaning that our physical form is not like the rest of creation that is here today, gone tomorrow. Our form will be resurrected. Our soul will be reunited with our body in the second coming. We were made to give glory to God and to participate with him and be children of him. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who joins himself to a prostitute becomes one body with her? In other words, it's the same conjoining as married couples. For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So in other words, by that same token, when we become united with God, we become one with God. Shun immorality. Every other sin which a man commits is outside his body, but the immortal man sins against his own body. And the reason why this is so terrible and the reason why uh, sexual immorality is considered such a horrible sin is because by its very nature, sexual immorality is about selfish love. It's all about you, your own gratifications, which is the exact opposite of God. God gives us agape, a opposite, ego, me, not me, selfless love. And so it is the antithesis of God. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? Meaning that our body is a temple. It's not the idea where we, you know, we, your body believes, my body is a temple, I'm going to make it beautiful. The idea is that your body is a temple. It is able to receive the sacrifice, Holy Communion. This is one of the reasons why we fast, for those that are able to fast, is we want it to be a clean temple, swept completely clean, nothing inside of it, so that when we receive the gifts, 
that it is a clean temple receiving it. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. We were made in the image and likeness of God. Our whole form is in the image and likeness of God. Our very breath is from God. In the ancient Hebrew, the Masoretic Hebrew, the verb for breathing is a present participle verb, meaning continuous breath, breathing of God, meaning that our very act of existence, our soul, is God's. It doesn't belong to us. But even that which was given to us, we destroyed through sin. And so when it says you were bought with a price, it means that we were slaves. We were slaves like on the auction block. And God paid the price for us. He sacrificed his son for us. A price was paid. It wasn't just a waving of a wand and saying, okay, now you're free. Someone died for us. Someone suffered for us. So glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to God. From the Gospel according to St. Luke, the Lord said this parable. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that falls to me. So in other words, this son does not want to wait for his inheritance. Rather than enjoy his father and love his father, he desires to have his inheritance so that he might leave and spend it his own way. And we see this with children from time to time. They don't want to be under the yoke of their parents anymore. They want to have freedom. And this is what St. Paul was talking about, the freedom that is illusory, that is actually not freedom, but slavery to other things. And he, the father, divided his living between them. Now, many days later, the young son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in loose living, prodigal living, hence the title of the prodigal son. And this is a sadness because what happens is when someone rejects what they know, they want to get as far away as possible. And so when they reject God, when they reject the teachings of the Father, they want to lead a life that is so antithetical to that that they will go into every kind of depravity, every kind of sin, because they want to reject. And we see this sometimes with people, that when children leave their, the household of a pious parent, they will sometimes not take their freedom well and just completely squander it uh, in prodigal living. And when he had spent everything, meaning that this, this son did not know how to spend his, his, his wealth, he was not wise, and this is a key element here, wisdom allows us to spend our wealth appropriately to make sure that we are judging correctly how much do we have left, how much do I have coming in, how much do I have coming out. And so he just spent it all. And Doubtless, while he was spending it, he probably had many friends, people coming in saying, yes, yes, buy me another round of drinks, buy me some food, buy me some dancing. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now this shows us just how low this man has fallen, because to be around pigs, swine, is defiling for the Jews. They're not allowed to have pork. They're not allowed to be around pigs. And so for this man to be now forcing himself to serve, first of all, he's now a servant, and now he is being paid to watch over pigs, which would be considered defiling. So he's completely hit rock bottom, but he's not quite there yet. And he would gladly have filled his belly with the pods the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Now, this is the reality of the world. He's looking at the filth that the pigs are eating. If you've ever been to a farm and watched how pigs eat, it's, it's gross. Uh, it's very, very disgusting. And so for him to say, oh, I'm so hungry that even that is looking appetizing to me. But we also see something more. No one gave him anything, meaning that outside of uh, Christ, 
we don't see kindness, we don't see uh, generosity. And we look at these qualities uh, and we think to ourselves, oh, that's just a natural order of things. But we don't seem to realize is that most of the good morality and kindness that we see in the world on a, nat on a national and international level came about because of Christianity. The idea of helping our neighbor in this regard, regardless of how our neighbor is to us, is something that Christianity established and promotes. The rule of the time was, well, get yours and keep it because no one's going to help you. You need to fight for yourself because no one's going to take care of you. And so even though he's suffering, even though he is struggling, no one's there to help him. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to eat and to spare? Now, let's take a moment here and focus on this line. When he came to himself, meaning that finally his eyes open and he's returned to the right way of thinking. The wisdom that he did not have has suddenly come to him. He understands. And this is important because he was at an inflection point. He could either despair and decide to end everything, or he could recognize, wait a second, what am I doing? I've been led completely astray. I've been deceived by the devil. I have followed my passions to the logical conclusion, which is death and despair, or I can repent. I can change my mind. Repentance means meta, meta, change, noima, my mind. He's having an about face in his mind and is looking back to his homeland, back to the people he knows, back to what is true. How many of my father's servants have bread enough and to spare, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your higher servants. And so we see here kind of a prototype of confession. Confession, by its very nature, means that we must confess before God our intention. Tell God we are sorry. Repent. But then we go to the priest and we are going to say our confession. So this young man, recognizing his sin, recognizes he is not worthy to be called a son anymore. He's not worthy to be called part of the household. And when we sin and cast ourselves out of God's household, the same can be said of us. We are not worthy to be called children of God anymore. But we say, okay, then you know what? At least I can be a servant in the house. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion. Now, there's a couple of things to look at here. First, saw him from a distance means that his father was always looking, always keeping his eye to the horizon. My son will come back. I will look for my son to come back. Even though his son had wished him dead, even though his son had abandoned him, he never stopped looking. And so God, our father, is always looking for our return, always looking for us uh, to repent and come to him had compassion, esplachnia. Ev is the word for good, like evangelion, the good news. Splachna is guts. So when the father is about to do what he's going to do to return his son to his former glory, he's doing this not without any hesitation, not with any, should I do this? Oh, I don't know. He wished me ill. No, he is completely in the right spirit of mind saying, I'm glad for this. My son is here. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, in Jewish tradition, a householder, a man of the father's nature, was supposed to be like a statesman, dignified, never run, never show any kind of um, movement like this. It would be undignified, it would be unrefined. So for the father to run to the son, it is showing that he's humbling himself and saying, I want to be with my child. And so even though it is beneath God to run to us, God runs to us to embrace us and kiss us, to have that one-on-one -on -one familial love. 
But this is where we see something important, because even though God will, will accept our repentance, we still need to follow through, and the son does follow through. He says to him, Father, I sinned against heaven and before you. So he is admitting his mistake. It would be so easy for him at that moment, while his father is crying and hugging him and kissing him, to say, I'm back, Dad, and leave it at that. But he doesn't, because his repentance is complete, and he's returning into the kingdom, and he is confessing his sin before his father. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So he recognizes that he's not worthy of this. He doesn't deserve this. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Now, the robe of the household is rich. And when we were baptized, we were baptized with a beautiful robe, our baptismal garment, and put a ring on his hand. Now, the ring, a ring is a signet ring. A ring shows to all of the other servants, this person is part of the household. This person uh, is part of the ruling family. That's what a signet ring is. And so when we become brothers and sisters in Christ, we become not just servants, but brothers and sisters, co-heirs in the kingdom. And shoes on his feet. Shoes were something that was only for the wealthy. Most people would only wear rags around their feet. So to be putting shoes on his feet shows, again, the return to his nobility. And on top of that, the ability now to move. Now the son can move as an apostle, as someone that is going to bring others to God. And bring the fatted calf and kill it. The fatted calf was a special cow that was um, almost like Kobe beef in the sense that it's a cow that doesn't do work, it eats the finest grains, it, it's, it's supposed to be um, very, very tasty, and it would only be used for the absolute most special occasions. And so to kill that calf means that this is going to be an amazing party. And let us eat and make merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. When we sin and cut ourselves off from God, it is death. Without God in our life, we are dead spiritually. He was lost and is found. When we're not with God, we don't know where we're going. We're blind. We're in the darkness of sin. When God returns to our life, then we can see everything. And it began to make merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what this meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. Now again, what do we see? Oftentimes when people return to church, we're angry at them. It's like, how dare you leave the house? How dare you leave the church? But notice the love of the father. He doesn't send servants to say, bring him inside. He himself goes out to his other son and entreated him. But he answered his father, Lo, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your commandment. Yet you never gave me a kid that is a small goat, that I might make merry with my friends. So in other words, the son, the, the elder, the son that uh, didn't leave, not that he didn't want to leave. He also rankled at, at being under authority, but he just didn't do it. So he was upset that he didn't get even any benefits from staying. But when this son of yours came, now notice, he doesn't call him his brother. He completely alienates him, says, that son of yours, who devoured your living with harlots, you killed for him the fatted calf. So for him, he can't reconcile this. He can't reconcile the idea of mercy and compassion. Because for him, it's so black and white. You're either in or you're out. Once you're out, you're out. But that's not how Christianity works. Christianity is about mercy, about compassion, about repentance. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. Meaning the gifts that the son wanted, all he had to do was ask. They would have been given to him. It was fitting to make merry and be glad, for this your brother was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost and is found. During this period of the Triodio, we are preparing ourselves. We are thematically going through steps to make ourselves ready for Great Lent and eventually for Pascha. And a great part of that 
is recognizing that we must return. We must come to ourselves, just like the prodigal son did, repent and return to our Father who loves us, and we will be filled again with grace. Our baptismal garment will be restored to us. Our lordly authority will be restored to us. Our ability to move and spread the gospel will be returned to us, and there will be rejoicing in heaven. Let us welcome those who do return and shower them with love and kisses like the Father did. Let us not reject them or hold animosity against them, but welcome the return with joy. I hope that you've enjoyed today's spiritual calisthenics. Have a blessed and wonderful day.